All right. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. I know everyone is, is always really busy, but we really are excited to take this opportunity to highlight some really important uh, veterans related legislation that's really going to help a lot of veterans, both you know, in our community and across the country. Um, so I'd like to go ahead and give it to uh, Congresswoman Mikey Sherrill. Thanks, Willie. I really appreciate it. Um, and thanks, everyone, for being here on such an important topic. I'm especially glad to have people here like Deborah Nixon, Ann Treadaway, and Bill Squires to speak with us because their voices, as with the voices of all the veterans and advocates that I work with across the district, have been so important to informing my work in Congress. As a veteran myself, I know how important it is to have veterans' voices in Congress. So since 2019, I've been incredibly proud of the work we've done from bills like Pause for Veterans Therapy Act, which I introduced with Rep Stivers from Ohio, to delivering long overdue benefits to veterans of the Blue Water Navy during Vietnam, the Vietnam War. We worked across the aisle to get veterans the benefits that they care about and that they deserve. But despite the progress we made in last Congress, we all know there is still more work to be done. The COVID-19 pandemic exposed so many places that we need to do more and do better. So I rely on our veteran community on the ground, advocates like Deborah, Ann, and Bill, to bring us their priorities, as well as the members of our American legions and VFWs. Earlier this month, I was moved by the very personal story shared at a veterans roundtable organized by the SOS veteran stakeholders that I hosted along with Senator Booker. We were focused on the need to establish a vet center in Northwest New Jersey. So I absolutely cannot do my work in Washington without all of your input and your advocacy. I'm thrilled to be here today to talk about the great work we've done so far and some new initiatives we're working on and to hear from you what work still needs to be done. So my first guest, which who I'm so excited to introduce is Captain Deborah Nixon. She's been working with our office for almost two years now and her passion and persistence have really made her a joy to work with. So Captain Nixon spent years serving in the Uniform Public Health Service, retiring in 2014. She's also a mom of a child with special needs. And when she retired, she elected spouse only on the survivor benefit plan because she was worried that the survivor's pension would make her son ineligible for Medicaid after her child began to receive the benefits. After she had made that selection, the law changed and special needs trusts were made eligible beneficiaries, allowing children with special needs to take advantage of their parents' earned benefits without jeopardizing other benefits. Unfortunately, that change in law was not accompanied by an open enrollment season to allow those SBP enrollees who had already made their selection to change their designee. When Deborah came to us with this problem, we knew we had to help. She and her family had earned these benefits and deserved to take full advantage of them. So that's why I was proud to introduce the Deborah Nixon Special Needs Trust Inclusion Act. This important legislation would create a limited open enrollment season for those SVP enrollees who weren't able to take advantage of the Special Needs Trust the last time around. This bill would recognize that the creation of a trust counts as a qualifying life event and should qualify enrollees to change their designate. So I'm gonna turn it over to Deborah to say a few words, but before I do, I just wanna thank you for your advocacy, your patience with the legislative process and your tirelessness in this effort. So thanks, Deborah. Thank you. Thank you again, Congresswoman Cheryl. Again, it's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you for the Zoom webinar inv invitation today. And at this time, I will be remiss to not also thank Willie Toba, Schaefer Bagwell and Esquire Luckman for all their assistance. And if I miss anyone behind the scene for this legislation, I really want to thank you. Yes, I have a story. My essentially, when I retired, I made the best decision I thought would be to just do spouse only. Not having adequate counsel or guidance, I was nervous in any direction. Do I go this way? Do I go to the right? Do I go to the left? So I made the decision to do spouse only. Then when everything changed, and believe it or not, how I found out about it was reading the MOA edition of Military Officer. That's how I found out about it. And so I, I contacted and the powers that be, which was the Coast Guard, who's the payer of my retirement pay, and also the PHS had given me authorization to add my son. Uh, when I contacted the Coast Guard, initially they did the change, but then they changed it back, telling me no, that could not be done. 
So I said to them, well, I, I knew that the no wasn't the answer because this was something greater, not just for the Nixon family need, but for greater for the veteran retirees. So with that, that's why we are here today. I went to the, the board for the Public Health Service Court and also to I, I'm a vet, baby veteran, I have to bring that up. And I got you know several rejections there. So then I moved on to an attorney, S.Y. Ruckling, who helped me massage how we're gonna move forward with this, recognizing that as you indicated, there was no uh, change in the law for which meant there needed to be that open enrollment or giving the opportunity to add our dependents. It's not easy. As you know, being a parent, if any of you are parents, you're always concerned about your children. But when you have a special needs child, there's greater concerns. Greater concerns, you know, not to impact their benefits, greater concern that the benefits are cut or the benefits are reduced. What will they do? I worked hard for my retirement benefit and I want to move this on to my son when my husband passes on. And with this Inclusion Act, this would allow me to do that. I also need to say thank you, although not deserving, for naming the act after me, but I really feel that this is the best we can do for our veterans and retirees who've worked so hard for a benefit. And like all parents, we want to know our children are set. And like I heard once in my last remark, you never stop being a parent to the day they say put you in the ground. And that is the absolute truth. Thank you all for this opportunity and thank you for doing such diligent and passionate work for Congresswoman. Well, you're certainly being far too modest. It is very deserving. You've done such wonderful advocacy and been so incredibly helpful. So I, I just, I thank you um, because of course, um, the reason I ran for office was to make sure our constituents are taken care of and people across the country are taken care of it. And this, um, this is wonderful to actually do legislation that is going to so directly impact people on the ground. Um, so I, I'm really glad you brought this to our attention and I'm really glad we can introduce this legislation. Thank you. Um, and, and certainly, and, and as you're even talking, I'm thinking of other things we can do. We've, we've uh, in Congress put money towards making sure veterans are aware of all the services provided. And the, the fact, you know, as you were talking about how you found out about this change, um, that got me thinking about more the, you know, the other things we can do to get word out to veterans on different changes and to make sure we're keeping everyone informed. Absolutely. But thank you so much. Thank you so much, Congresswoman. And thank you again to all of your team for moving this along. I, you know what, and, and thanks for thanking Willie. I, um, he's fantastic. Um, oh, he's he and, and Schaefer, a great team um, in the New Jersey office and DC office. So Absolutely. yeah, they are, they're very, very focused and, and, and really wonderful to have Absolutely. on the team. Thank you again, and thank you again. Thanks, and, and so I wanna talk about some more legislation we've done, again, to directly help um, veterans as, as they're getting through um, difficulties, and, and this one is more related, a little bit more related to COVID, because for the past year, we've all put our lives on hold in so many ways. And now we're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, um, but we want to make sure that we learn from this past year and how do we prevent this from being a lost year. So we're also faced with the challenge of rebuilding the country, its economy and its workforce. And of course, veterans have always been critical leaders in advancing our economy and strengthening our workforce. And one of the great tools leveraged by our veterans as they contribute to their communities and the economy and the workforce is the GI Bill. For so many veterans, though, the unplanned closure of their educational institutions, um, some of the issues with child care, which Ann and I were just talking about and commiserating on, um, they really did put everyone's life on pause. And the time limits associated with some GI Bill programs means that veterans are at a real risk of having that last year, a year where they couldn't use their expiring educational benefits and won't recoup that opportunity. So this would be a detriment not only to those veterans who work so hard, but also to all our local communities who benefit so much from our veteran neighbors and coworkers. So that's why I introduced the GI Bill Need Act this week. This important bipartisan legislation will empower the VA secretary to hit pause on veterans GI Bill educational benefits from expiring when they are prevented from pursuing their education because of a national emergency. And then they can restart once the veteran is able to safely return to their educational program. This is really just a common sense solution that not only will ensure veterans get their well-earned benefits, 
but also ensure that our communities benefit from veterans returning to the workforce with increased skills and capabilities that'll help us all recover from the past year. So I have to thank the veterans who raised this issue with us on virtual roundtables and in conversations with my team, including Ann Treadaway, who we have here today. Her advocacy with our office really highlighted how important this bill will be and what a difference that extra year can make. So, Ann, do you want to talk a little bit about your experiences? Absolutely. And I want to take the second to echo everyone else and thank you for your leadership and your team's leadership on this important legislation. To be honest, you know, this makes sure that veterans don't fall through the cracks, the ones that are impacted by this. You know, what we've seen is that we know that student veterans, about 40 to 50% have children, around 50% are working full time. So when COVID happened, I, I, as we were talking about childcare, I have five-year-old twins who could bust in at any moment. If I was taking a class, that could cause a problem as it might during this meeting. For our students, what we found, and I can speak for not just Rutgers and New Jersey, but the Big Ten as well, in our meetings, we've discussed seeing a drop off in enrollment. And that reason has a lot to do with either no childcare or having children who are also doing synchronous classes. You know, you can't all be at the same table doing those classes effectively. And the priority, as Deborah mentioned, is the children, right? They're the focus. And so taking that time off might have put these veterans just shy of graduating and finishing their degree. And this makes sure that they're not going to fall through those cracks. Other examples that we heard besides childcare and synchronous education for children is lost employment. The GI Bill is incredibly generous, especially the post 9-11 GI Bill, but there are other costs associated with education. And because of layoffs and other uh, COVID realities, those individuals might not have that extra additional funds to continue on. And another uh, not complaint, but reason we saw students not enrolling for another semester or choosing to, uh, you know, take some time off was because they're not getting the same level of support they would get when they're physically on campus. There's a reason children, uh, children, there's a reason that veterans choose to attend physical classes, um, not just the support they get from the faculty in the classroom, but on campus. And as much as we've tried to compensate with that, through Zoom and virtual meetings, you know, there's, it's just a bridge a little bit too far to cross. Because of this legislation, we're going to make sure that those students can come back when we're back in class um, and pursue their, their education. And so again, I, I just very much appreciate this. And I know I speak on behalf of my peers in the Big Ten and other individuals who work with veterans in higher education. This makes a difference. And those veterans are gonna appreciate not being forgotten. I think you raised such great points. Um, as I mentioned, I was hearing, I'm not sure how you're doing this meeting, quite frankly, with five-year-old twins. Um, I, I was uh, joking with Ann earlier, I have a nine-year-old and it's um, she and her 12-year-old brother were running through my room the other night as I was trying to conduct what I thought was a fairly important meeting. They did not agree with me. Um, but uh, so it's been, you know, and, and that's what kids who are slightly older. Um, so it's always a struggle, especially as we're going through homeschooling and trying to get through it. And I think you really raised another great point. And I went back to school after my service in the military and it's different. Um, you know, when you go to college, as I did right after high school, and um, you're sort of in that mindset, you're, you're ready to go back to school. But once you've taken that time off, I was in the Navy for almost 10 years, Going back to school, it, it's a little bit of a shift and, and you have to kind of get back into to, to that. And it would be difficult if you weren't in person, if you didn't see other students who after class you could kind of talk to. And a lot of the students who are um, at our universities who um, maybe went right after high school, don't have families, they can you know, maybe get on Zooms all night long whereas you're trying to put the kids to bed and <laughs> can't really join that. So that in-person experience I see why that would also be so important. So um, again, this is um, something that I'm so thankful to you uh, for advocating for, because it just means so much when we can actually pass legislation that will be meaningful on the ground um, to people's everyday lives. And, and that's what I'm hoping this will do. So thank you again as well. Um, as everyone can see, we just have such, such great veterans in our district and, and in the state. So I'm so happy to have you here today. And another 
Um, even though I, I like to tease him a lot, so it kind of pains me to tell everyone how awesome he is because <laughs> I usually like to like to give him a little guff because he was a P3 pilot and I'm a helicopter pilot. But um, I'm so proud today to talk about um, um, all the assistance that the American Rescue Plan delivers to help our veterans and their families to get the care and services they need. And so um, I just have one of our fantastic uh, veterans here, Bill Squires, who does so much for our community. Um, so even before the pandemic hit, too many veterans in our country were facing issues with finding a suitable job, finding stable housing, and making sure they had reliable, ready access to health care, especially mental health care services. All of that got even harder as COVID spread through the country. So we delivered over $16 billion to bolster the VA's health system, which has really been critical to meeting veterans' health needs over the past year. The flexibility of the VA's providers to see and treat patients under new protocols and via telehealth, it's really been amazing. We provide additional assistance for job training, claims processing, and making sure the VA is ready for the next pandemic. Crucially, we provide funding for state veterans homes, which we all know were some of the places which were earliest and hardest hit last March and April. So again, to talk about this, I'd like to introduce Bill Squires. Bill uh, is a Naval Academy graduate, also a Naval aviator and retired from the Navy as a commander. He has been truly a tireless advocate for our veterans and veterans causes. And he's worked closely with our office on so many issues. On a personal note, he gave us a real scare last year with COVID and has, uh, has deep insight into that issue as well. So I wanna thank Bill for joining us today and give him the floor to talk about some of the veterans priorities in the American Rescue Plan. So thanks again, Bill. My pleasure, Mikey. Um, it's an honor and privilege to live in Congressional District 11, I can tell you that. Um, I tell a story a lot, but I think it's, it's important to tell is, uh, several years ago in 18, when I found out that Mikey was running for office, you know, and I found out she was a fellow Naval Academy graduate, I said, I got to meet her. I think I can help her. If she answers a couple of questions, right. Um, and so we sat down a little coffee shop in Montclair, and we got to know each other a little bit. And I asked her the first question. I said, so what are you going to do for our military and our military vets? She kind of looked at me. She says, Billy, you did read my bio that we did go to the same school, didn't we? I said, okay, let me ask you the next question then. That, that answered it for me. And the next question was, what are you going to do for health care? Because I do have a child with special needs as well. And, of course, she, she nailed it. And, um, you know, there's a lot of people down there who walk the halls of the Capitol and walk D.C. that are elected officials. But I will challenge uh, anybody to find somebody who not only talks the talk but walk, walks the walk like Mikey does. Uh, she's a person of conviction. She's a, she's a, uh, a lady of her words. And uh, she and I've, I've closely observed her and like I, I brag about her all the time to my friends who don't even live in New Jersey, but all over the country about how fortunate we are to have her as our congresswoman. But, you know, the veterans, extremely important. I'm a veteran. I'm fortunate. I don't have any uh, disabilities, but, you know, I know veterans who do. And the mental health is an issue. Homelessness is an issue. Uh, getting back, getting jobs is an issue. And when I look at what everything the American Rescue Plan has done, I mean, 14.5 million to support the health care, 14.5 billion, I'm sorry, to support the VA's health care system. And that includes, uh, you know, vaccination distribution efforts, um, you know, supporting the state veterans homes, you know, out of sight, out of mind for a lot of people. They don't realize what's going in some of these hospitals and some of these homes. We, we absolutely need that support and also providing money that uh, to help train uh, veterans for jobs. Um, you know, a lot of their benefits have been utilized, have used up, and they're still. And now Congress and, uh, is providing additional money to help these veterans, you know, get back on their feet, support themselves, and support their families. And, uh, and I'll tell you, as a veteran, uh, we're proud of what we did. Uh, I'm not sure we really expect a whole lot when we get out, but there are services available to us that we want to take advantage of. We want to be treated correctly, and and I think I think I'm seeing a turn. You know, I know I'm seeing a turn, and that's a it's a credit to Mikey. Um, and I, like I said, I, mean, I don't know what else I can say about her and, and her support. She's, but she, you know, like I said, she walks the walk, she talks the talk, she gets the job done. And uh, and I know it's 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 nice to hear these stories about continuing education, and about Miss Nixon there about you know being able to support her, her um, child with special needs. And you know these things don't get done. You know a lot of I think elected officials will listen, but they won't do anything about it. Well, Mikey's the exception to the rule. Uh, so, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll always be here for her, no longer, whether she's an officer or not, because she's done so much for me personally, 
As a matter of fact, Mikey, I'll just show you. Tomorrow's my one-year anniversary of going into St. Barnabas. So I've got a lot of magical dates coming up here. But uh, but I know you were by my side while I was in a hospital and while I was in rehab, and I love you for it. So just keep up the great work. You know, those veterans mean the world to us, and just keep it up. Thank you. Well, thank you. I, I feel incredibly lucky to be the Congresswoman from the 11th District of New Jersey because um, we do have fantastic advocates here who are working tirelessly, not just for themselves. I, I know, Bill, they're, they're certainly um, working on behalf of your son and veterans, but, but really for the community at large. And the issues that Deborah and Bill and Ann have brought up, they're not simple issues that will, will affect one or two people here. They affect people across the nation in really powerful ways and really take care of our veterans and in, in ways that hopefully will make people feel a little more secure and like they, they can really count on their future just a, a little bit better. So I, I really um, can't thank all of you enough. I, we're gonna turn this into a mutual appreciation society. So I'm gonna cut myself off there, but, but you all are so fantastic. And I do, I, I do really appreciate you coming on today and then all of the advocacy you've done. Um, so with that, I'll turn it back over to Brian, I believe. Is that right, Brian? Yes, thank you, Congresswoman. Um, so thank you to everybody for joining us. We're going to turn towards our press Q&A portion. So if there are any press on the line, um, you can use either the raise hand function under the participant tab or the Q&A button on the bottom uh, to write in your question. Um, while we give that a few minutes to populate, uh, and if there are any questions uh, adding to the queue, um, I had a few questions that were written into me by folks who are either dialed in or couldn't make it. Uh, first, Congresswoman, what's the impact that you've seen uh, to veterans care during COVID um, and what can be done to address those issues in northern New Jersey? So that's a great question. And I'd say one of the hugest impacts across um, the state and uh, as you know, some of the, the general issues sometimes impact our vulnerable veterans community more and that's mental health. Um, we've just seen mental health issues on so many levels um, in our children who aren't in school, um, and many people are facing job loss and insecurity, but certainly our veterans have um, traditionally in recent years had a higher rate of suicide than the general population, especially our women veterans. Um, and we've seen those mental health issues compounded um, during COVID. And so that's why I'm fighting so hard to get a vet center in the district uh, in Morris or Sussex County we know that people in the western part of my district have to travel sometimes over an hour to get the mental health care they need. These vet centers too, it, it just strikes me again and again as I talk to um, parents, especially our moms across, um, across the district, you know, these veteran centers are open at different hours because oftentimes if you're working during the day or if you're taking care of your kids during the day, it's really hard to get into the VA system at those during those times, but but these veteran centers are open up uh, for longer periods of time. You can also bring your children to the vet centers, which you can't do at the VA often. So um, so this would be just such a crucial piece of handling some of the the mental health issues experienced by our vet veterans. And finally, we have a lot of combat veterans at these facilities, and and many of us know who served as veterans that some of the mental health issues related to service, especially in some of, especially during wartime and combat duty are, are unique and different and hard to explain sometimes to people who don't share that experience. Um, so these are really critical pieces of the healthcare system for veterans. And that's why um, recently Senator Booker and I held a round table on this very issue and we're bringing people together to support the fight for the veteran center in our district. Great, and then we have one more question that was uh, written in. Um, Congresswoman, the, the two bills that you introduced over the last week uh, already had bipartisan support. Um, are you confident uh, that you'll also find a partner in President Biden uh, and that he'll, be, um, uh, he'll support you in these issues uh, and that they'll eventually become law? You know, I, I'm certainly confident. Um, we've seen over time, uh, President Biden, uh, through his long history of public service, has always fought for veterans. And we also know that he and, and Dr. Jill Biden are, you know, this is personal for them. They, they, are, um, they are parents of uh, veterans. They, they've been parents of service members. They know what it's like to, to fear for your child overseas. Um, and 
and to worry about them. So this isn't just something that we know President Biden's been good on over the years, but we know he has a personal connection to taking care of our veterans. So yeah, I feel incredibly confident that we as the veterans community can really count on this president. Great, and then we've got um, one hand up uh, from, uh, I believe one of our veteran stakeholders who's also on the line. Um, I am gonna call on him. Wayne Stein, uh, you should now have the ability to talk. Uh, if you could just unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, how you doing? Um, good afternoon. I just want to commend everybody on our great work, uh, especially Willie uh, Toba. Really appreciate Willie's hard work and coordination. Uh, I'm the commander of VFW Post 8096 over there in Butler. So uh, just going forward, I uh, just want to just, you know, outstanding work. Uh, I feel like you guys got a lot done in a short period of time, which we appreciate. I have a meeting uh, next week. I'm going to convey um, everything that was said at this meeting to my veterans. Um, as far as the vet center goes, I personally had used uh, vet centers in the past. Uh, C Caucus, I believe in Bloomfield one, uh, received excellent work there. Um, they have a group counseling session that they did with uh, combat vets like myself. Uh, I was able to definitely help myself out along with a lot of other veterans who I know and work with closely. And uh, I appreciate you guys what you're doing. Uh, keep up the good work. And I look forward to uh, working with you all uh, in the near future. Thank you. Well, Wayne, thank you so much. Um, you know, obviously, thank you for your service. Um, and, and thank you for, for talking a little bit about these vet centers from a firsthand point of view. And I would point out that if you're using the Bloomfield or Secaucus Vet Center, that's quite a trip for you from Butler, um, which just, I think, again, points out the need for um, our veterans to, to be able to seek that support a little bit closer to home. But Wayne, I really do appreciate it. And, and again, I, I think um, maybe what everyone should take away from uh, some of this round table is what a tireless worker Willie Tolba is. I, I don't get to thank Willie enough, so I love that. Then we're, I know he's probably, he's, he's not on the, uh, he has his camera off because he's probably turning bright red, but, um, but it is just uh, wonderful to hear because I know how tirelessly um, he's been working as well for all of our veterans. So thank you, Wayne. Great, thank you all. I'm gonna give a call for any last second questions. In the meantime, Congresswoman, uh, do you wanna say any final words uh, and any of our panelists that wanna say any final thoughts, turn it over to you. Um, well, I, I'm going to turn it over to Ann, Deborah, um, to see if they have any final words. And I, but before I do, I just have to thank them again. Um, you know, being a, a public servant, I really rely on the public. And I think one of the most meaningful things President Biden said in a recent speech um, was that he needs all of us. We're in a democracy, and 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 in order for this to work, I need, you know, I need everyone to, to alert our office to how we can make this country better, how we can do better legislation, how we can make laws that, that help people and impact people on the ground. And, and Deborah and Ann, you, you've done just that. And, and I can't thank you enough um, because nothing makes me happier as a member of Congress than passing and, and supporting legislation that's gonna make people's lives better. So thank you again. And um, I'll, I'll turn it over. We started with Deborah, so this time we'll start with Anne and then I'll turn it over to you, Deborah. Thank you again for having me. I think the only final thought I would wanna share is I always highly encourage any veteran who is eligible for the GI Bill to use it. Um, in my immediate family, my brother served and my father served and neither used the GI Bill and both saw it expire. And if I hadn't used it, I wouldn't have gone on. I'm the first in my immediate family to have a bachelor's degree, have a master's degree, and I'm finishing my doctorate. And that's already much farther than my immediate family, but they had the opportunity, but you know, life takes over and you don't, you don't use it or you think you can't. But even if it's a class at a time, work with whatever school you wanna to go to, um, different training certificate programs, but you earned it and you should use it. Thank you once again for the opportunity to talk about my personal experience. But I have to agree with everyone on the line today, uh, Congresswoman Cheryl, you are the best of the best. And I'm so, <laughs> so impressed with you. 
Um, when you when, when I looked at your commercials, I said, that is a woman that is going to make a difference. And you have, and you will continue. So I do want to thank you. And I know that I speak today for all the parents with special needs, adult children or children, but this is, a, you have helped bring us out of the quicksand. I say many times when you go through something, there's a lot of people around you going, you're going down further into the quicksand, but no one's doing nothing. You are the one who helped pull me out of that quicksand. So I do want to thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you both. That was really wonderful. Thanks everybody. I, I really appreciate it. And um, we'll continue to push out the information and certainly um, for all the veterans out there, if you have questions, obviously, you know, um, I care deeply and we have a great advocate in the district as well and Willie Tolba. So please reach out to my office if you have any questions or need any help. And otherwise, have a great day and take care. Thanks so much. Thank you again, Meg. Thanks.